does. Do you have a? Uh, so, <laughs> welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the virtual Baku American Center. Delighted to uh, to have people join us today for the first in a three part series on the American legal legal system. Um, we are delighted to. Uh, to have with us, and I'm delighted to introduce the curator, the the leader of of this session, um, Professor Judith Stiles Ogden. Um, professor Ogden is an emeritus associate professor of law at Clayton State University in Atlanta. Um, she is a recognized expert in multiple legal fields, notably including dispute resolution and conflict resolution, on which subject she has written more than 18 scholarly articles. Um, Professor Ogden has worked with Mediators Beyond Borders in Sierra Leone and was until last month in Azerbaijan, where she was a Fulbright Scholar teaching at the law departments at Ada University and Baku State University. Um, as I mentioned, Professor Ogden is going to be joining with us to offer a three-part series introducing Azerbaijan to different elements of the American legal system. Today, the first session of the series, she will be talking about the institution of the jury trial, which is one of the foundations of the American justice system. And we are, we're delighted to give you a chance to, to better understand how trial by jury works, how it was conceived, its rationale, and so forth. So before I introduce or before I hand the floor over to Professor Ogden, I just once more like to say how happy we are to have you join us and invite you to leave comments and questions, moreover, especially questions for Professor Ogden in the comment field. I will be reading them to her and we will, uh, at the end of the session, have plenty of time to go into them. So please do ask lots of questions. With that, it's my great pleasure to once again, hand the, hand the floor to Professor Ogden. Judith. Well, thank you very much. And I'm really happy to um, be here and to participate. And I'm glad that we can still do this um, with so many things going on. I do miss being in um, Baku and Azerbaijan, but I'm pleased to talk about um, the American legal system. And so I have some PowerPoint slides. And so, um, okay, now I have to bring them up and tell me if this works. It's perfect. It's perfect, okay. Professor Ogden. There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> Technology always worries me a bit. Okay, so um, the first in our series about the American legal system is to talk about trial by jury because it's really an integral part of the U.S. legal system, but we know that not all countries use it, and so sometimes there's some curiosity um, about it. So um, a definition of the jury is that it's a group of people who are selected and sworn to inquire into matters of fact and to reach a verdict on the basis of the evidence presented to them. So one of the things that's important about um, this definition that sometimes people don't realize is that the jury just decides the facts in the case. They decide what they think happened. They decide whose version um, of the story they believe. It's up to the judge to know the law, and he explains the law to the um, to the jury, so they don't have to be um, lawyers. And we'll talk more about that um, later. So in the United States, civil and criminal uh, trials are frequently decided um, by a jury, and so ordinary men and women are really given considerable power in the uh, court system. And many of us believe it's a cornerstone of our um, democracy. And, you know, people, ordinary people, when they watch um, the outcome of a trial or if they're watching a trial, all they see is lawyers. A lot of times they're not sure um, what's going on. They don't really understand why the result is what it is. So being part of the jury gives the average person um, an important part to play in the legal system. So um, the Pew Research Center did a study of um, um, U.S. adults and asked them about how they feel about serving on a jury. And most um, adults, two thirds of them said that they believe that serving on a jury is part of what it means to be a good citizen. Interestingly, though, um, the same survey found that younger people and minorities 
um, weren't as convinced that that is true. Um, in the average year, maybe about 15% of adults in the United States get a request to serve on a jury. Um, you know, they're, they're, um, they get a questionnaire in the mail and they send it back and they're assigned um, a date to show up either in state or federal courts. So about 15% of the population gets a notice every year. And um, out of those that are called to come to court, only about 5% ever really serve on um, a jury. Most people are um, dismissed without even being on a case. So Americans point to the Constitution for our right to trial by jury, um, but the concept actually has some ancient origins. And scholars differ on the origin of jur juries. Um, in ancient Egypt, around 2000 BC, matters were adjudicated through the Kenbet, which was comprised of eight um, jurors. So these were, it was kind of like a council of elders, and they were from both sides of the Nile, and they adjudicated um, disputes. Um, they didn't have judges. In fact, there's no word in ancient Egyptian for the word judge. And then by the 6th century in Greece, um, the dicastus um, was a system that was used for citizens to try and pass judgment on um, cases, but they really didn't apply the law. According to Aristotle, juries in Athens instead decided cases based on their understanding of uh, general justice. So maybe this is just a common sense approach to resolving disputes. And so it's believed this system then was uh, evolved into the Roman system. And so some people believe that when Rome conquered um, England, that they brought this type of jury system with them. So that's one theory on how um, the British developed a jury system. Um, others believe that the Anglo-Saxons introduced trial by jury. This is probably a more popular um, belief. In addition to trials by jury, though, they also had um, ordeals. And so um, your fate was decided by trials of physical test or combat. So I think I'd rather have the jury trial. But by the late 800s, under the leadership of Alfred the Great, uh, trials by a jury of one's peers had become the norm throughout England. In the 12th century, Henry II was now king, um, and he developed a version of the jury system um, made up of regular citizens to decide disputes over lands, and these were held in secular courts. And this occurred after he was involved in a struggle with the papacy in Rome, and um, the disputes were decided in secular courts, not in church courts. Henry II also, though, uh, utilized inquisitions and ordeals. Then in May of 1215, the um, barons, uh, dissatisfied with years of abuse at the hands of Henry's son, John, uh, banded together and they confronted King John at Runnymede. Um, and at knife point, they forced him to sign the Magna Carta, which, um, in addition to other things, declared that no person was above the law, including the king. Um, and it also states that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or seized or exiled or in any way destroyed except by the lawful judgment of his peers and by the law of the land. So then here in the colonies, initially um, the court system and the jury system resembled the system that had been used in England, but sometimes the Crown opposed the decisions that um, the colonial juries would uh, return, you know, in terms of um, finding someone not uh, guilty. And so the king didn't really like some of these verdicts. And so the crown began denying colonists the right to a trial by jury. So this outrage of the colonists, um, it was one of the factors leading to the American Revolution. And in fact, um, when they wrote the Declaration of Independent, Independence, they listed 27 oh complaints that they had against the king, and um, one of them was 
depriving us in many cases of the benefits of a trial by jury. So while this was going on, in addition, the soldiers who were um, living in the, the colonies, um, if they killed someone, oftentimes they were protected from punishment from, from the crown. So the founders of, um, of the United States, when they were writing the Constitution, they believed the jury was central to the rights of the new nation. Um, and they saw it not only benefiting the accused, um, but was also a check on the judiciary because the judges before the revolution um, were appointed by the king um, and they kept their job as long as the king was happy and their salary was determined and paid by the king. And so um, there wasn't really this neutral um, branch of government uh, deciding their fate. And that was another complaint that they had in the Declaration of Independence, that uh, um, the relationship between the king and the judges. So today the Constitution establishes safeguards um, to the right to a trial by jury in four different places. Article 3 establishes the right in federal crimin criminal cases. The Fifth Amendment provides for grand juries or similar panels, um, and this is who, just, who will decide whether to issue an indictment, um, and if they do, that means the accused will be brought to trial. The Sixth Amendment guarantees, um, in serious federal criminal cases, the right to a trial by a petite jury, so this is a smaller jury, and we'll talk about that um, in a few minutes and it's probably the most for, uh, common form of jury. And the Seventh Amendment provides for a jury trial in civil cases where the amount in controversy exceeds uh, $20. So I guess at one time, $20 uh, seemed like a lot of money and was a big, a big civil case. Now, um, the Bill of Rights that, that the Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendment are, of course, from, um, initially really only applied to the federal government. But the U.S. Supreme Court has decided that many of the rights provided for in the Bill of Rights should apply to the states through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. And one of those rights is the Sixth Amendment. So in uh, criminal cases in um, a state court, at least where you're facing a possible sentence of six months or more, you have a right to trial by jury. Now, many states offered in their own laws and constitution a right to trial by jury, but they did not all provide for that. And so the U.S. Supreme Court extended that right to state courts also. Uh, jury selection is the process for choosing jurors. Um, and um, generally the starting point is that potential jurors are randomly selected from lists of voter registration, um, you know, property owner uh, lists, driver's license lists, and then the prospective juries, jurors are summoned to appear for jury duty. Um, and this group that shows up at the courthouse of prospective jurors is called a veneer. Um, and veneer um, in Latin means to come. So they are summoned to come to the court to serve as potential jurors. Now, who can be, who can serve as a juror? Well, every state has its own um, set of requirements. These are the requirements for federal court, and we can pretty much assume that most states are very similar. You have to be a United States citizen. You have to be at least 18 years of age. You have to have resided in the judi judicial district for at least a year. You have to be adequately proficient in English to satisfy um, satisfactorily complete the juror qualification form. You have to have no disqualifying mental or physical conditions. You're not currently subject to felony charges publishable by imprisonment for more than one year. And you've never been convicted of a felony unless your civil rights have been legally restored. So maybe you were pardoned. There are three groups who are exempt from federal jury service. Um, members of the armed forces on active duty, members of professional fire and police departments, 
and public officers of federal, state, or local governments who are actively engaged full-time in the performance of their public duties. Now, once the veneer, the group of um, potential jurors is assembled, then we go into a process called voir dire, and voir dire means to speak the truth. And um, this is the process by which the attorneys primarily interview the prospective jurors. They ask them a series of questions to determine if they're competent to sit on the jury. The judge may also ask questions, but it's primarily the attorneys who do this. Um, and so they want to eliminate jurors who they feel might be biased. And they're trying to determine um, who's most likely to be sympathetic to their uh, side. So you're probably seeing um, movies, read books, um, maybe even seen some American TV shows where there are, in big cases, they may hire experts to help them determine um, who would be best to serve on a jury from their point of view. Now, um, the attorneys on both sides get to reject potential jurors in two ways. They can dismiss anyone for cause. So you can have an unlimited number of jurors who are dismissed for cause. So maybe they um, they know somebody who's involved in the case. They had hired one of the attorneys. They know the defendant. Um, they've appeared before the, the judge. Um, someone with a connection to anyone in the case can be um, eliminated. Uh, the attorneys also get um, a limited number of what we call peremptory challenges. Um, and how many you get depends on what court you're in, you know, depends on state law. Um, and there may be in some cases where a judge can increase the number of peremptory um, challenges. But it's usually two to three. And um, these are people that you just don't want to be on your jury. You don't have to give a reason. Um, they don't have a connection um, to anyone on the case. It's not a, um, a challenge for cause. Um, you're just trying to eliminate people who you think would be biased against uh, your side. And you get, depending on the state you're in, you get uh, two to three of these. So there are a number of different types of um, juries. The first I'm going to discuss is the grand jury. And it's called the grand jury because it's relatively um, large. Um, may have 16 to 23 um, people on it. And states use grand juries to decide if there is enough evidence to indict a person, to um, charge them with a crime and, um, and then put them on um, trial. So there has to be enough evidence, has to satisfy probable cause to indict a person. So um, grand juries um, are not really trials. They don't decide that the person is guilty. They just decide if there's enough evidence to take the person to trial. Um, they're usually closed and not open to the public and um, the potential defendant um, doesn't really participate. His uh, attorney does not participate. They don't ask uh, questions. They, um, it's conducted behind closed doors and um, usually the prosecutor presents enough evidence to con potentially convince the grand jury that the person should be charged with the crime. And we say that they are indicted. A petite jury then is a smaller jury. This is what we're used to thinking of when we think of a jury. It's usually got six to 12 people on it. Um, this is what we use in criminal and really in many uh, civil cases. Um, so if it's uh, a criminal case, they're going to decide if the person is guilty of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and their discussions are called a deliberation and they are held in private. Um, and during the trial, the defendant and his and her, her lawyer um, or the plaintiff, it's if a civil case, they all have a right to present evidence and to interrogate witnesses in front of the um, jury. In cases in which the jury verdict has to be unanimous, if the jury cannot come to a unanimous decision, we call this a hung jury, and the judge will uh, often request a uh, mistrial. So if a mistrial is declared, um, if it's a criminal case, then the prosecutor has to decide, do we want to do this again? And if he decides 
to do it all over again, they bring in a whole new jury and start from the beginning with a brand new trial. Sometimes though the prosecutor decides that um, there's really no point, um, the case isn't strong enough, this is probably gonna happen again and um, decides not to go ahead with the case. Uh, civil juries are, are really petite juries also, but um, they're not deciding the guilt or innocence of someone. They're um, listening to testimony in civil cases and deciding who wins or who loses. Excuse me. They're usually open to the public. Uh, sometimes um, they may be closed if there's some sensitive information um, being introduced, but usually they're open to the um public and so civil cases would involve things like personal injury cases like maybe an automobile accident or a slip and fall or it might involve um, somebody suing for a breach of contract. A coroner's uh, jury is a group that is brought in and the coroner is holding a, a hearing. Um, this happens when someone has died and the job of the jury is to decide the cause of death. So were they murdered? Was it an accident? Uh, was it suicide? Um, and the jury then, if they find it was uh, that a murder has been connected, they can name a specific suspect who will then be tried for uh, the crime. Um, the size of the coroner's jury can really um, vary anywhere from six to uh, 20 people. Um, it's oftentimes closed to the public. The potential defendant, again, isn't going to be um, introducing evidence. There's really primarily evidence as to the cause of death. Now, I mentioned earlier that the jury decides the facts in a case, and they rely on the judge to explain the law to them. So throughout the trial, they're receiving uh, instructions from the judge. And he's also going to tell them um, the relevant points of law. He's going to explain the law to them. And they are bound to accept it and to apply it as he explains it. Not, uh, their decision should not be based on what they thought the law was. Uh, during the trial, the judge will direct the jury to disregard inadmissible testimony. Um, and provides guidelines on the way to behave outside of court. So it's typical um, when they go home for the day for him to say, don't discuss the case with anyone else. Um, don't read any newspaper articles about the case. Don't watch um, any news reports on TV about the case. So at the close of um, the trial, both attorneys will make closing arguments to the jury and then the jury is sent out to deliberate in a private room. Um, no one else is there except for the jurors. And when they've come to a decision, they come back to court and the verdict is reported by the jury foreman or forewoman. Um, in federal jury trials, Defendants have a right to unanimous verdict. Um, that's not always true in state jury trials. And it's really the size of the jury that determines whether anonymity is required. And when I say required, I mean by really the U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution. So um, in some states, a 12-member jury may convict without unanimity. Um, now, just because a state allows for that, um, doesn't mean that they have to. Some states would still require a unanimous verdict um, in a criminal case. Depends on state law. But if a state is going to use a jury of six people or fewer, um, the verdict has to be unanimous. That's how the uh, Supreme Court has in interpreted the Constitution. Now, the jury verdict isn't really final um, after the jurors um, explain their, or deliver their verdict, I guess I should say. Um, they're excused, the judge thanks them for their service, but the trial isn't really um, over. The trial doesn't technically end until the judge enters a judgment. 
Um, and a judge can set aside the jury verdict. Um, probably in the majority of cases, they do not do that. It's a very unpopular thing to do, um, but they can, and they can uh, set it aside for um, one of two reasons. They can issue a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. This is sometimes called um, a judgment NOV. NOV stands for non obstante verdicto, just Latin for notwithstanding the the verdict and a judge would do this if the jury's verdict is against the weight of the evidence or if the evidence is insufficient so it's more than just that that he would have decided it differently or she would have decided it differently um in the judge's mind i guess the case really makes the decision makes no sense it, it's not consistent with the um with the evidence and so in the rare occasions this happens the judge can set aside the verdict. Another thing that can happen is the judge can um, also award um, a new trial. And this would occur when there's been an error that occurs a trial and it's something significant. It's something that would have made a difference in the outcome of the case. And so um, there couldn't have been a fair trial. And the only way to fix that is to do it all over again. So if the judge finds either of these, um, he or she may set aside um, the verdict. If not, they would enter a, um, a judgment consistent with the verdict. And these two motions that the judge can consider um, set, to set aside the verdict, if the judge um, does not grant them, these can become issues on appeal. Now, in criminal cases, the defendant is entitled perhaps to a jury trial but the defendant doesn't have to have a jury trial. They can waive their right to jury trial, and this is called a bench trial. When you ask the judge to um, ask as, act as judge and jury and decide the case, this is called a bench trial. So one of the things that's interesting about uh, jury trials, even though we consider it a hallmark of the American legal system, is that in recent years, there has been a tremendous decline in jury trials. Um, in fact, Fewer and fewer cases go to trial at all, um, and of the ones that do, jury trials are even less common. So it's estimated, and the best numbers we have are really just estimates, it's estimated that 95% of um, all cases settle before they can even go to trial. Um, approximately 2% of trials have juries. So even when there is a trial, most of them don't have juries. Um, and the ones that do, two thirds of them are criminal cases, you know, where someone would ask for um, a jury trial. Most criminal cases are settled by plea bargaining, which helps manage the heavy caseload in most jurisdictions. So probably 90% of criminal cases are settled by plea bargain. And the reality is that if um, the parties no longer entered into plea bargains, the courts could never handle. Um, the volume of cases if everybody wanted a trial. Um, and some of the other reasons that parties uh, perhaps settle prior to trial in civil cases, especially ones that are fairly com complex, um, to go all the way to a trial can be extremely expensive. And uh, sometimes they can be really confusing. So for the average person listening to a very complex case that maybe goes on for weeks and weeks, um, it can be very confusing. Even for attorneys, it can be very um, confusing. And so sometimes um, your, your result is better if you decide to settle ahead of time. Um, there literally have been cases that have gone on for two years. Now, how anyone remembers what the evidence is in those cases, I'm not really sure. They also find that if you have a non-jury trial as opposed to a jury trial, so you let the judge decide, the, um, the trials tend to be two to three weeks shorter, so they're faster and probably less expensive. And um, another, um, another thing that has uh, resulted in fewer trials and more settlements is an increase in the use of mediation, arbitration, and mini trials. And um, in a later webinar on uh, May 26, we're going to talk about the use of mediation and arbitration. So that brings me to the end 
of my slides and I'm going to try to go back and find, find, find okay, find, find Richard and maybe you have some questions and maybe others have questions, so. Yeah, indeed. No, I know I've got lots of questions, lots of thoughts on that. That was really, well, as always, right? That was really enjoyable. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, and I invite people watching to uh, to submit your questions, which I will read to uh, Professor Ogden. She can't see the she can't see the comments in, in the current configuration, so I will relay them on. But in the meantime, I wanted to ask, is there a, is there a thinking, uh, Professor, as to what is the most likely outcome for delivering a, a just or well-reasoned verdict? Is the jury trial, I mean, who, who wants a jury trial? Who waives it? Does well, that make sense? Yeah, well, it seems like a couple different questions, but that's okay. Um, I guess it is. Probably, um, one of the, the statistics I mentioned is that um, two thirds of the cases that actually have a jury trial are criminal. So in terms of who wants a jury trial, probably criminal cases um, are more often, would be um, the type of case more often. But the reality is the majority of criminals don't want a jury trial either. Um, and, um, and some of that is because, um, you know, the average person, I think, being on a jury and they hear what the person is charged with, um, maybe shocked and outraged and, but the judge has heard it all before. And so, so a lot of times I think criminal defendants believe, um, they stand a better chance with, um, a judge, at least in terms of, they may be convicted, but sometimes when you do criminal defense, you know, you, you're not going to get a, a, an acquittal. Sometimes the best you can hope for is for the defendant to be uh, convicted of a less serious offense. And, and I would think you might have a better chance um, with a judge than um, perhaps with a jury. But, you know, it really depends a lot on the type of case. Is it criminal? Is it civil? Um, some civil cases are extremely complex. Um, and so I may not want um, a a, a jury of the average person, you know, if it requires an engineering degree to understand the evidence, I wouldn't understand it. Um, it probably depends on, you know, what your defense is, what your view of the case is, what your theory of the case is. Are you in uh, federal court? Are you in state court? Who's the judge? Who's your attorney? You know, so I don't know if that answered your question, but um, it just depends, you know. <laughs> Uh, as to so much in life. No, indeed. Um, I see Halima's got a very good question, which is not unrelated to what we've just discussed, but just in a civil case, who who determines whether it's jury or or judge uh, based? Is it the the pro is it the plaintiff or is it the defendant? Well, well no, um it depends on the state you're in. The, um, the Constitution says you have a right to a jury trial in, a, it actually says in suits at common law. So that means um, the, the basis of the suit, the cause of action would have had to have been something that was recognized at common law, like um, um, you know, negligence has been recognized for centuries type of thing. It has to be for more than um, $20. So really, both sides have a right to an, um, a jury trial if they want it. Um, so to go non-jury, really, the parties would have to agree. We, we don't want um, a jury trial in a civil case. In a criminal case, it's the defendant's choice. It's not the prosecutor's. But in a civil case, both sides have a right to uh, jury trial, so they would have to agree. Um, to, to waive that. Yes. To okay. Go to so Halima asks, what are the advantages and disadvantages of jury systems, which interesting, you addressed some of those in your previous answer, but there's possibly some philosophical elements that you didn't get into. That's a great question, Halima, thank you. Well, I, th I think um, in the United States, even though there's a decrease in actual jury trials, you know, I think we would hate to see it just disappear because it gives um, the average person a, uh, an opportunity to participate in the legal system um, and prevents judges who in many states now are elected um, 
as, as opposed to being appointed, but even so, it, it prevents them from just doing whatever they want because if you have a jury there, you have some oversight. Um, and in certain types of cases, you know, I mentioned that in some criminal cases, oh, the judge has heard it all before. Well, maybe your situation is different and you, and you don't want a judge who's heard it all before. You want to make an appeal to your peers and you think that they would um, understand. So I think um, the primary benefits are um, that it that the jury is much more neutral than somebody who works for the state would be necessarily. Um, and it's some oversight on the legal system. And there are going to be situations where you feel comfortable being judged by your peers. So I don't know. Does that answer the question or? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's a it's a pretty complex question, but that's a that's a pretty solid answer. Um, I wonder, I, I'm not familiar with the Azerbaijani legal system, but I'd be interested if any of our audience wanted to, to answer in the, the comments section what the what the means of rendering a verdict here is. Is the jury trial at all? In practice here, Judith is saying no. She's obviously done a little bit of research in her time at Ada and Buckley well, State University. When I was actually there and talking to my students, you know, it's my understanding there are no jury trials. And the students were um, skeptical of jury trials. That wasn't oh, the really. system. What was the, what was the reason behind their skepticism? What are the downsides, downsides uh, according to, to the future lawyers of Azerbaijan? <laughs> um, they were concerned that a, a jury of ordinary people could be swayed too easily by an attorney and that the, so if we had a judge deciding the case the judge would be more professional and wouldn't wouldn't be as um, easily um, wouldn't be as easily um, swayed um, and and I admitted that it's definitely possible for a, um, a persuasive attorney to um, you know, perhaps influence a jury, but that's why both sides have attorneys. So our hope is that they cancel each, each other out and that they're both persuasive and one doesn't have more influence than the other. Excellent. Um, I would love, I mean, we're, we're taking questions, of course, but I would love to see audience comments as well on whether they think the, the jury trial is, is something that would work in Azerbaijan and, and what, if not, why not? And if so, why? Um, it is interesting about, I mean, it's a, it's a good point that a clever attorney can sway a journey, a jury and justice can be diverted. I remember watching the jagged edge, like, like most Americans, I <laughs> learned what I have through the, uh, TVs and, and TV shows and movies, but, uh, the Glenn Close character saying to her, to her, uh, client, wear a blue suit, juries love blue suits. So it does suggest that it's not an entirely scientific evaluation of the uh, the case on its merits that goes into it. Um, in in the world, Judith, and I, I apologize for asking a question out of left field that you may not know. In the, is the jury trial a a fundamental part of uh, global legal uh, legal systems? Well. Um I'm trying to think of the of the number I saw. Maybe 80 countries out of 193 use juries. Um, they're used most often in countries that were English-speaking part of the British Commonwealth. It's probably the most common. And um, and some countries use them maybe for criminal cases, not for civil. So um, so it would seem that the majority of countries do not use um, a jury trial. You know, ones that ones that um, you know were based not on the British common law, but more on the civil law system of um, continental Europe that spread to Africa, Asia, South America. Right. So it's kind of a, it's, it, it really is somewhat of a, um, a British common law theory. Well, it makes good sense. I mean, the idea of a, a jury of one's peers is, is a pretty compelling idea, particularly from a time period in which, justice was handed down, possibly without full regard to the, the merits of the case, but other other cooked in factors. Um, so I'm not seeing a lot of questions from our audience. Um, any Anybody else? And again, love to have comments as well, thinking about the uh, 
the jury trial is something that may or may not work in the Azerbaijani context. So please, uh, please share your thoughts with us. Um, another question I would have on on the jury trial is: for, First, have you practiced before? Have you argued a case before a jury yourself, Judith? No, no, um, no I was not a trial attorney. I've I've done arbitration, but as the arbitrator. So I mean, I've done hearings, and but I've never done a big trial. Okay, is that I just as we say, a good attorney can can possibly sway a jury at law schools. And I guess this would be less material here in Azerbaijan, but at U.S. law schools, is do they bring an acting coach in to to help the, uh, the aspiring <laughs> clients to to really make the case? Well, you have to appreciate that I went to law school a really long time ago, so it's been. 40 years, I guess, as I heard from law school, and the curriculum has changed tremendously. So when I was in law school, they did not, um, they did not bring in um, <laughs> acting coaches. We had, um, but did you have, did you have classes? That, that we had a trial tactics um, course, but it wasn't so much geared to trying to persuade people that's, to believe something that wasn't true. It was more, how do you introduce evidence? How do you, how do you make it persuasive? But it was all very ethical. Um, and I think what people worry about with jury trials is that some of what attorneys do may not be quite so um, ethical. Can you but give I, an example? No. I'd love to hear one in case I find myself in the dark. <laughs> well, I think just, um, you know, well, anyone from the United States, of course, has watched Law and Order. And so there's always that issue in Law and Order where you, where the attorney brings in evidence that they know is not true. Um, and that's unethical. And, um, you know, but unethical, if nobody knows it's untrue, if you don't get caught, then you could potentially get away with it if nobody knows it's not true. And so um, so that would probably be, I would think that would be my might be the greatest offense if you are a trial attorney to introduce evidence that you know um, isn't isn't true. Right. Um, so, and does that answer your question? I, I I start talking and I go on and on and then I. <laughs> no, it absolutely does. It was a uh, an diversion. <laughs> it was well worth the trip. Um, <laughs> exactly. No, that was excellent. Uh, well, very good. A, a last, uh, a last question, and then I will, I will be. Unless we have uh, questions from the audience, do you, do you see? I mean, we've seen that in practice, the the application of the jury, the trial by jury, seems to be diminishing, with more and more cases being argued before judges or before arbitrators. Do you, do you think it will remain, you know, fundamental? fundamental piece of American legal, uh, the American legal system? Oh, I think it will. I don't think that we could, um, even if nobody uses it, I don't think we'd ever want to reach the point where we'd say, you can't have a jury trial. I think we'd always want that um, safeguard. Uh, and to the extent maybe reform is needed, I'm not sure that the problem is with the jury system per se. Um, it's probably more um, with the court system generally and the, and the legal process. And people have been asking for reform um, for as long as I can um, remember. Um, and um, I don't know if anything in that regard will will um, change, but it, it might. Um, you know, I'm, I was born in the middle of the baby boomers, and I always say that whatever I decided to do, so did millions of other people. So going to law school, I went to law school at a time where everybody was going to law school. And so there were many more attorneys than there ever were, were jobs. Um, but the boomers are getting old and, and we're retiring and passing away. Um, and so I don't think we, we have yet seen a, um, big decrease in the number of um, lawyers um, because we boomers still at least practice part time. Um, but I think in the future we'll see um, fewer uh, lawyers. And um, and I think this is one of our problems. There are too many lawyers. And as you, you can just, you know, they've um, tracked it statistically as the number of lawyers increase, the number, of course, the number of lawsuits um, increase and just really complicate the whole 
system, but um, I'm, I'm not sure anybody will do anything about that other than try to talk people out of going to law school. But, <laughs> but well, I mean, that's a topic for a different conversation. Yeah. But you're hearing that the the uh, the legal system and the is is particularly the corporate legal industry is is forever changed. I think by the financial crisis of 2008, that the mm -hmm. The billing system, for instance, doesn't make the practice of law as lucrative, <laughs> and there are fewer. <laughs> so that's a good thing, huh? Still, a very litigious people, but. Um, <laughs> but I think oh, that the problem is with the system, not necessarily with having a jury per se. And if the system um, improves, um, maybe more people will use um, juries. But I don't think it'll ever. I don't can't imagine that we could ever give it up completely. Well, I should hope not. Again, it is really a, a foundation of, of our legal system. And again, the idea of a jury of peers is is really at the basis of, of democracy, isn't it? We do, I do have another question. Um, Aliyah asks a very interesting question, which relates tangentially to some of the points we've already discussed, which is jury members do not have any legal background. Does it mean that a very emotional speech of a defense attorney can easily affect them? Well, I think it depends, you know, they're just people choose, chosen at random. Depends on who's on the jury. I mean, you could have an attorney on the jury. They're not prohibited. It's unlikely, but, you know, you have all sorts of people. So, um, I, so an emotional <laughs> argument by a defense attorney, um, the, you know, it could sway a jury, but um, to have it sway all 12 people, um, I think is probably less likely because they're going to be a real mix of people um, who are on the um, the jury. Usually, that's that's the ideal. That they're a mix of people, but I'm sure um, that there have been cases where you had a really persuasive, emotional um, defendant and their attorney, and um, it influenced the jury. I'm sure that's happened. I I mean, we're only human after all, right? Yeah, blubbering away up on the stand. I can't convict that guy. <laughs> um, excellent, very good. Well, uh, I think I don't see any more questions. So before we uh, conclude, I would just say my own view of the jury trials of interest. There's some really fascinating movies and films out there that that really show how this works. I think Twelve Angry Men is it's one uh, of the best. Is one of the best. Yeah. Is a great movie. In fact, I'll even put that in the comments. Um, uh, this is a, a wonderful movie, and I'm sure it's easily available. Yes. Um, Twelve uh, with Henry Fonda. Yes. Twelve Angry Men. So. It's funny because it's a little bit dated, um, because um, it's like all white men on a jury. Um, and so um, you'd never have a jury that looks like that today, but, um, but it's an excellent movie with excellent acting. Um, and so a lot of people I know use it in negotiation classes because, you know, Henry Fonda is, is able to persuade the other jurors and it's a lesson in persuasion really. Um, and, you know, another movie I might recommend is, or book is um, Grisham's Runaway Jury. Aha, uh -huh, John Grisham. They must have made a movie out of that as well. They seem to have yeah. yes, it has been everything he ever wrote into a yeah. feature length film. It has been a movie. I may list her or other. <laughs> it, um, it, it involves having the experts who were trying to. I mean, it goes. It's fiction, so it goes a little extreme, but it shows how um, you know big corporations will hire these experts to try to. Um, decide who, who do you want on your jury? And they profile all the potential jurors. And so that's a little frightening. I don't know if it's really that bad in real life, but it's a little bit frightening. Okay. A movie that shows how a jury should not work, but is, is quite <laughs> an interesting depiction of the American legal system is, oh, Atticus Finch, uh, the, uh, God, goodness help me. Atticus to Finch, our lead to kill a mockingbird, exactly. Probably, yes. Uh huh. Not how a jury is meant to work, but a, a really very dramatic depiction of uh, the jury or the legal system, the trial, the trial system. Anyway, 
I will leave it at that, but thank you very much, Judith. Remember, everybody, uh, thanks again for joining us on May 19th. The second, uh, the second installment of this series is going to continue with, with Professor Ogden talking about search and seizure, which is another critical part of, of the criminal justice system in, in the American, um, American legal process. And then as, as Professor Ogden mentioned earlier in, in her talk on May 26th, she will be talking about arbitration and mediation, which is, is very, very close to, to her, you know, the, the core of her specialization. So that'll be a great, uh, great look into the world, mostly of, of commercial law. So with that, um, Halima, thanks you for a great session as does Zara. So thank you all very much for joining us and Professor Ogden, thank you so much. Um, thank, you. thank you for joining us and we'll see you uh, on May 19th. Okay, thanks. All right, bye then. <laughs>